Welcome into Outkick the Show. It is a hell of a good day for the good guys. A hell of a bad day for the Corona Bros out there who are going to be utterly crushed over all of the good news rolling in on Monday. We begin with the stock market surging 1,000 points nearly. 900 and change. Got up over 1,000, came back at the closing bell, up 900 points. Almost back up to 25,000. All right? We are roaring. Numbers of deaths on the coronavirus plummeting. If you read my coronavirus update on Twitter yesterday, you know that the media now, the media has moved on from we don't have enough tests to now the newest problem is there aren't enough people going to get the test. That is the new problem. We had over 400,000 tests completed on Sunday. Lowest positivity we have seen in months. And the death rate continues to plummet from this thing all across the nation. And the media is desperate to find something else to terrify you with. And as a result, we are absolutely dominating. The economy is going to come roaring back. Sports are going to come roaring back. All of this is moving in a very positive direction. I am telling you, it is going to be absolutely fantastic. People are saying there's no volume. That is your problem, not mine. If you can't hear it on Facebook, it's probably your issue. I always have to tell people, like, I can't hear it. It's your phone. It's your Facebook feed. It's probably not me. All right? I love all of you. We have a lot to get to. But I want to start here. United States, California, and New York. Let's start with California. It wasn't very long ago, a couple of weeks at most, 10 days, that Governor Gavin Newsom and California politicians were telling you not only would there be no pro sports in California for the rest of 2020, but that there would be no pro sports maybe until 2021 or 2022. Just about 45 minutes ago, California Governor Gavin Newsom reversed course in a hurry. They said, hey, look, it's time to recognize that Arizona and their governor said, hey, pro sports are welcome to be here. And then Governor Ron DeSantis did an incredible job and he said, hey, if other states won't let teams play, they're welcome to come here. And then guess what happened? Finally, people started to look at the data and recognize that what we need to do is protect people in nursing homes because that is where the vast majority of people are dying of the coronavirus. And in fact, this is not a partisan issue. This is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democrat issue. Data doesn't have a party. And what you need to do is to look at the data and the data was telling us what a lot of smart people have been telling you. This is really two different viruses. It attacks the old and the weak and the immune suppressed and by and large the young and healthy like me and you and I hope a lot of other young people have almost nothing to fear. I've been coming on this program for weeks telling you that the data reflects we need to get the economy back to work and we need to do so with young and healthy people. I wish nobody ever died. But what we need to do is focus on the virus and where it's killing people 
as opposed to actually worrying about the entire nation and quarantining everyone when a tiny minority of the population is in danger here. I just saw somebody say in the comments as I happened to look by FDR was right. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Let the data instruct a positive response for the nation. And I got to give credit to Andrew Cuomo at least on this. He's been straightforward. We'll play the video here from Andrew Cuomo as part of a shorter clip. Say he's a big Bills fan. He wants to watch the Bills. Andrew Cuomo has been consistent that he wants sports to come back even though the state of New York is the hardest hit by far and the New York City region is the hardest hit by far in the entire nation. I'm going to give credit to Gavin Newsom for changing his mind but the data has never reflected that Gavin Newsom or California was making the smart decision for their state. And I'll tell you, it's gotten hardly any attention. But Texas and Governor Abbott have a much lower death rate per capita than California does and they haven't embraced the same platform as California. Florida and Governor Ron DeSantis who has been raked over the coals has been raked absolutely over the coals the governor of Florida has. The per capita death rate in Florida is almost identical to the per capita death rate in California. And so while everybody wants to praise Gavin Newsom and Andrew Cuomo the governors who I think have done the best job are as follows. Ron DeSantis in Florida. Abbott in Texas. Stitt in Oklahoma. uh, Bill Lee in Tennessee. And the guy who has been criticized the most but has actually been the most instrumental in getting America back running again. How about Governor Kemp in Georgia? Georgia has now been open for over three weeks and they have shown America that if you open back up even with terrible criticism being levied against him Governor Brian Kemp has done absolutely incredible work here. Absolutely incredible. All five of those states Republican governors all five of them ripped to the high heavens by the national media and guess what has happened when the data hasn't reflected that the world is going to come undone? Guess what has happened? They have lost their words. The stories have disappeared as soon as it became clear that Florida was opening up and it wasn't turning into New York as soon as it became clear that Texas was opening up and it wasn't turning into New York as soon as it became clear that Georgia and Tennessee and Oklahoma were all opening up and they weren't falling apart it became incredibly easy to see that the media didn't show up to cover those stories at all. But those governors who looked at the data and said it's time to get back to work deserve all of the credit. And I want you to notice what the mainstream media is telling you now. They now are not saying that we need more tests because it's becoming evident that we have plenty of tests now. They are saying we need more people to take the test. That's what the Washington Post had an article about. New issue, new problem has arisen. There are too many healthy people and not enough people who think they're sick, not enough people who are scared and want to go get a coronavirus test. We are going to have sports back soon. Now let me say this. Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, uh, MLS, all of these team sports, they need to get their act together. Got to give props to NASCAR and golf which came back over the weekend. NASCAR with its highest rating in three years surged in the sports landscape. Major League Baseball can't lose this opportunity. They are going to have a chance to get back in front of the public. They can't blow it like 1994 all over again. I'll tell you a story. Back in 1994 I was a huge baseball fan. 15 years old. 
Cincinnati Red fan. I was in the crowd getting ready for uh, the end of the season. Loved baseball. Watched the Braves on WTBS all the time. Watched the Cubs on WGN all the time. I was in love with baseball. Baseball disappeared that August. Never actually came back. And as a result, as a result, I never came back to baseball the same way I was a fan before. There are lots of people out there right now who are desperate for sports to come back and for normalcy to return. And if baseball can't figure it out, if they cannot figure out a way to get back, this is a major indictment of the sport. Everybody is taking less money right now. I'm taking less money to do my jobs. I have a contract. I took a voluntary pay cut in television and I took a voluntary pay cut in radio to try to protect the jobs of other people because the advertising market corresponding to the national uh, economy completely collapsed overnight. Your boy, who has a contract just like Major League Baseball players, took less money, like a lot of people out there who are fortunate enough to still have jobs, like a lot of people out there who aren't even fortunate enough to still have jobs, I took less money to try to help out other people at my businesses and try to avoid us having to lay off more people. Okay? I'm doing that. Lots of you are doing that. Now is not the time for Major League Baseball to make the decision that its players are going to get greedy. There are a lot of players out there saying, well, if I can't make my whole salary, why should I play? You should play because sometimes you owe it to your audience to do something that gets you less than maybe you thought you were going to make. This is important. It's an important lesson. When you are in the public eye, you have an obligation, in my, my opinion, to your audience. And as a result, sometimes you might have to take less. There are all different sorts of people out there. Almost everybody in this entire nation is making less than what they were making before the pandemic. And if you are not willing to take a haircut in the short term in order to help your overall sport grow in the long term, you are, in my opinion, an imbecile. Okay? I could have. I'll give you an example. I could have just said, you know what? I'm sitting out for several weeks because there's no sports going on. Instead, I've shown up every morning to do the radio show. I've shown up every afternoon to do this show. I've continued to write. And if you are not smart enough to understand that sometimes you have to take less in order to make more in the long run, then you are mortgaging the future of your business, of your brand, and of your life. This is 100% true. And don't sell me the idea. Don't even think to sell me the idea that you are somehow under tremendous amounts of danger. If you are a young person in America today, okay, if you are a young person in America today, under 24, a young athlete, you are under more danger to be struck by lightning than you are to actually die of the coronavirus. You are under more danger driving to the stadium, traveling to spring training, than you are from the coronavirus. Look at the actual data. Don't buy into all the hype. Look at the CDC data on death. And if you are actually of the opinion, it's important, if you are actually of the opinion that you are going to die, you are wrong factually. The odds of that happening are nearly zero. There's a difference between an opinion that is rooted in fact 
and one that is rooted in hysteria. Okay? This is not difficult. The data tells you what the truth is. And when you examine the truth and when you actually look at the data, what you will learn is what I am telling you, which is young, healthy athletes are not in danger. But, guess what? If you don't want to play, you shouldn't have to. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of minor league baseball players that would kill for the opportunity to play right now. And so, if you are not wanting to work, you don't have to. If you are a diehard Corona bro, like Blake Snell, and you are convinced that you are going to die if you leave your house, guess what? You never have to leave your house again. But for the rest of us, those of us who are actually looking at the data, and those of us who want to get the American economy roaring again, it's time to get back to work. Major League Baseball, the NBA, the NHL, MLS, all of them need to be ready to roll sooner rather than later. And I give Andrew Cuomo credit for saying that even in the hard-hit region of New York City, he wants sports back sooner rather than later. California, even now, is starting to make sense going forward about the idea of sports coming back. They have gone from sports aren't going to be played again until we have a vaccine in 2021 or 2022 to now they can play in June. And I keep hammering this home because I think it's important. I hope we get a vaccine. And I hope that no one dies and I feel awful that anyone dies of anything. But 2.8 million people die every year in the United States. And we can't allow every bit of public policy to be defined by one virus that isn't killing very many people in the grand scheme of the world. Okay? We can't allow that to alter everybody's life forever. I hope we get a vaccine. I hope we are able to bring a vaccine back and everybody's going to be able to be vaccinated nobody else will die of the coronavirus soon. I hope. But the only two things that can allow us to eventually get past the coronavirus is either a vaccine, which may or may not happen. I hope it does. Might take years. I hope it's less. But it's an uncertain outcome. Or herd immunity. And in order to get herd immunity, you need as many young and healthy people as possible out circulating so that the people who get it are less likely to actually be negatively impacted by it. And let me hit you again with this fact, okay? It's important. When we initially went into our homes and we were told, hey, you are not going to be able to leave your house because for the next couple of weeks we're trying to avoid overloading the hospitals. Remember we were trying to flatten the curve? We were trying to turn this into this? Well, guess what happened? We flattened the curve! And we flattened the curve to such an extent that we almost bankrupted uh, hospitals because all the doctors and nurses got furloughed by and large. We never went into our houses with the idea of we're going to stay there until a vaccine is found. We went in there to flatten the curve. We did it. It's time for everybody to come back outside and get back to work. Uh, All right, we got some funny stories out there. Uh, We got some funny stories out there that I want to hit. But first, Europe. You notice how Europe has disappeared from the mainstream media narrative? That's because Italy just hit a low in deaths and new cases. Same thing about deaths is happening in France, Spain, Germany, and England, all of the major European countries. Notice when everything was awful, you heard about Italy all the time. Italy, Italy, Italy. As soon as Italy got fine, people stopped talking about it. You know, they're back to work in Italy. You know, they're opening up the borders to allow tourism in Italy again starting June 3rd. You know, they're back in school in Germany. Do you know many European countries have their kids back in school already and they're back to work? As soon as the coronavirus was beaten in Europe, and it stopped to be a negative story, the story disappeared. Worth keeping an eye on. Uh, All right, a couple of funny stories that I want to hit you with. We got a cheerleading scandal. We got a cheerleading scandal out of Kentucky. Did you guys hear about this? 
They fired four cheerleading coaches for the following reasons. I don't know about you, but this sounds like exactly the kind of cheerleaders I'd like to have. Here are some of the allegations. During a team retreat, some cheerleaders performed gymnastic routines that included hurling their teammates from a dock into the water while either topless or bottomless. Nude gymnastics. That sounds like something I could get behind. The routines known as basket tosses were done at the direction of other members of the squad and within view of at least some of the coaches. Coaches also allowed cheerleading alums to bring boats and alcohol to the cheerleading retreat where some cheerleaders were partially naked and or drinking while riding on boats. God bless America. If cheerleaders can't get naked and ride around on boats, what are we doing as a country? This is what I want my cheerleaders to be doing. Get naked and drink and party on boats. Coaches didn't confiscate alcohol. Why would they? Uh, And during a cheerleading camp in Tennessee, uh, some cheerleaders were directed to perform without any underwear. This sounds like every cheerleading fantasy that has ever existed in the history of mankind. We shouldn't be criticizing the University of Kentucky. We should all aspire to what the University of Cheerleading, uh, University of Kentucky cheerleading squad was all about. That's a pretty funny story. Another kind of funny story. South Korea is playing baseball without fans present in the Korean Baseball Association, I believe. Without fans present, they decided to put mannequins in the stands. I guess to make it look more normal on television. Only one problem. What was the problem? Evidently, they ordered Korean sex dolls. So, instead of having mannequins in the stands, the Korean Baseball Association says that they inadvertently ordered Korean sex dolls. Uh, And I'm not an expert on the Korean sex doll industry, but it seems to me that it would be relatively difficult to inadvertently order sex dolls, especially dozens or hundreds of them. Maybe that happens to you sometimes. Maybe you're just chilling at your house and you're on Amazon and you're clicking on a couple of things and then boom, inadvertently, there are sex dolls arriving at your house. But then, once the sex doll got there, I would imagine they had to blow the sex doll up and I would imagine once the sex doll arrives you would notice but they took them and they put them in the stands and now it is a controversy in South Korea that they had fake fans that were actually Korean sex dolls. This is a real story. Good start to your Monday. I tweeted out the link. Uh, Finally, we had the last dance. Last dance was phenomenal. Uh, really great documentary, top to bottom. I think it created a new uh, type of way to tell a story. Prior to this, great athletes might have done an autobiography. Now, now you have the mix of an autobiography with a documentary, which is what we saw here, and I love the way it was done. I would like to see other athletes also have their own Jordan-level documentary told. I would suggest Tiger Woods would make a lot of sense. Tom Brady. Peyton Manning, maybe Roger Federer, Serena Williams, Usain Bolt, maybe Michael Phelps. People that have incredible and interesting stories that are some of the greatest of all time. Allen Iverson, Wayne Gretzky. A lot of you are putting the names in of who you would like to see. Mike Tyson would be incredible. We're going to talk a lot about this tomorrow on the Outkick the Coverage radio program. Uh, But there are a lot of guys that would be fun to watch. Kobe would have been great. I don't know that we can do it. Mike Tyson, Barry Bonds. I mean, you guys are running through entire lists of people that you would like to be able to see. And the suggestions are all fantastic. Hulk Hogan would be great. Brett Favre I would like to watch. All of these would be really very interesting 
and I'm looking forward to in general. But that would be outstanding. And what I would say is several different things stood out to me from the last dance. First of all, how about Jordan finally acknowledging it wasn't the flu game. Instead, it was the food poisoning game. And I want to know who those five pizza delivery guys were and what they did and what they were likely to have done. I would love to see what the story is there in terms of what they put in that pizza and whether it almost killed Michael Jordan for him to be that impacted for that long by it. I want to see what that story is. Uh, And it definitely changes things a little bit for it to be the food poisoning game as opposed to the flu game. But Jordan scored 38 in that game. Series was tied up 2-2 and they went back and won game six uh, in that one. How about Jordan's relationship, though, with the security guards? This, to me, was maybe the most interesting part of Episodes 9 and 10. Most people surround themselves with an entourage of people that are somewhat like them. What is fascinating about Michael Jordan, to me, is he decided his entourage would be older security guards. He wasn't concerned with what people thought about him. The entire point of most entourages is... They make the guy who has the entourage look bigger and better, Cooler than he otherwise would. Jordan was so comfortable in his own skin that he wanted to hang out with these older guys. And I think it's utterly fascinating. In an era when everybody has an entourage who's famous, Jordan had a totally different entourage, which I think speaks to Jordan's own comfort with his self-identity. He didn't define himself by what other people might think of him. Now, the other most interesting part of Michael Jordan's persona is how he could find fault anywhere. Uh, We found out that Brian Russell said, why'd you quit? And as a result, Jordan picked him apart. Um, We certainly heard about uh, Carl Malone, Clyde Drexler. Jordan could manufacture a reason to dislike anybody. And that was the fuel that drove him But ultimately, he was comfortable enough in his own skin that he wouldn't in any way need to worry about what other people thought about him. And that that led to what I think was ultimately Michael Jordan's greatest attribute. And this was something that David Aldridge said. Jordan lived in the moment better than almost any other athlete. What he meant by that was most of us in life spend time worrying about things behind us or we spend time worrying about things in front of us. Very few of us on a day-to-day basis think about what's going on at this exact moment right now. And Jordan, his greatness was he wasn't thinking when he rose up to try a shot, what's going to happen if I miss? What are people going to say? He was so enmeshed in the moment. I think this is a good lesson for everyone out there no matter what you do. Most people live in the past or they live worried about the future. Very few control the exact moment that they're in right now. I'm going to do the best job that I can with the minutes and the hours and the seconds that are in front of me right now as I work as opposed to looking into the future. And I think that does speak to why Jordan was so good in the moment because he didn't have the hindrance of past expectations or prior expectations or what people were going to say. That is a great lesson for everybody out there regardless of what you do in life. Mental toughness is important. How about Dennis Rodman? Disappearing. Disappearing in the middle of the playoffs to go to the WCW after Game 3. And as a result, as a result, disappearing forever. Can you imagine this story? In the NBA Finals, he goes on WCW with Hulk Hogan. Now, I'm curious with you guys. I talked about this on the radio show earlier. He was also dating Carmen Electra. Who's the modern day Carmen Electra? And who's the modern day Dennis Rodman in the world of sports? Do we have anybody like that? at all? Do we have anybody out there right now who is a modern day Dennis Rodman or a modern day Carmen Electra? I was trying to explain on the radio program this morning. 
for the young cats out there. Who is Carmen Electra today? Somebody who is so... I think there's like a thousand Carmen Electras and they're all on Instagram. Kim Kardashian is an interesting argument but I feel like Kim Kardashian eh, it's a little bit different. She's more like Paris Hilton. Right? Does that make sense? Um, and, and Kim Kardashian is... Yeah, somebody said she's way too wealthy. Carmen Electra was known only for being hot. Right? In the 90s we had these Maxim and we had the Stuff Magazine and they had all these cover girls and they almost were exclusively known based on how hot they were. Um, and Carmen Electra in the 90s when Dennis Rodman was with her was like the hate, uh, hottest girl of all time. And I don't know that we have an easy analogy here. Rodman there isn't even an easy analogy in the world of sports. But can you imagine if a guy disappeared like that in the middle of the NBA Finals, what the reaction would be now. Uh, that was uh, that was just crazy. couple more things. I want to give props to Carl Malone for showing up on the bus after he lost Game 6 and congratulating everybody on the Bulls. Carl Malone has always seemed to me like an incredibly classy dude uh, who obviously he and John Stockton didn't get to win a championship. But what I have always said is if you think about LeBron James, he basically mixes. Uh, LeBron James is John Stockton and Carl Malone mixed, right? He's got the ball handling ability of John Stockton and the physical size of Carl Malone. He basically melds those two best players from the Utah Jazz. And that in and of itself is an interesting storyline when you think about the evolution of basketball. Uh, but got to give props to Carl Malone. We also see, saw Leonardo DiCaprio uh, back uh, old school Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and then I also want to say the Jordan jumper in game six to win the game. When Rodman was like, we knew he wasn't going to pass the ball. And the way that they zoomed in on that crowd and it was all Utah Jazz fans. And then you saw the one Bulls kid in the crowd exulting that was fantastically well done. Jordan said, I felt like we could have won seven. He said it was maddening to leave at the peak. He didn't want to leave like that. I actually think when you look back on the last dance and the way it aired and the discussion surrounding it, this will effectively become Michael Jordan's seventh title. Because the overall impact of Michael Jordan in the world and his legendary status has only grown as a result of this documentary that arrived right in the middle of the quarantine that everybody watched as a part of their family with your kids, with your dad, with your grandpa, whoever it would have been. This has further burnished Michael Jordan's legend in a way that LeBron James will never come close to ever, frankly. And the reason why is because Jordan is universally beloved in a way that LeBron will never be. Great stat from David Falk. Jordan's shoes today sell two times as many pairs as every current NBA player combined. More people watched Game 6 of the NBA Finals in 1998 than have ever watched a basketball game in the history of the world probably unless you can count some of the Olympic games. But in terms of the NBA that, that audience will never be equaled. Jordan doubles the number of shoes that LeBron, Steph, James Harden, Russell Westbrook whoever you want to name sells today and he hasn't played for 15 years or whatever the heck it is. For me the Michael Jordan wizard years will never happen forever etched in my memory as a sports fan will be that jumper that he drained to end his career with the Chicago Bulls in Game 6 back in 1998. All right, I love all of you. My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick the Show. If you enjoy it, share the podcast, which is audio only. Tell your, tell your friends to watch on Facebook. Tell them to watch on Periscope or watch us on YouTube. This is Outkick the Show, and I love all of you. Kisses. See y'all. 
Thank you, Facebook. See you guys.